All right, so but it's a phenomenon called factivity in semantics. So I will explain to you what that means and then I'll present you the, the results. So I'll, I'll start with factivity and then I'll give you a first study contrasting knowing and thinking. And then we'll extend the results to a, a, a range of other types of, of, of predicates. So factivity, so there's many ways of defining factivity. I don't have time here to go through the details, but a common understanding of factivity is that a propositional verb, so verb in English followed by that, by que in French, by das, and other synthetic constructions in other languages, triggers a factivity presupposition when the speaker, the person who utters the utterance, must be committed to the truth of the propositional clause. So let me give you an example to, to tell you what that means. Peter can only say, John knows that Pittsburgh is nicer than Philadelphia, if Peter believes that actually Pittsburgh is nicer than Philadelphia. If he does not believe that much, what would he say? He would say, John believes that Pittsburgh is nicer than Philadelphia. So he used, if Peter uses the word no, he's communicating the fact that he believes that Peter is nicer than Philadelphia. He's committed to that uh, fact. Right? Um, and verbs that trigger a factivity presupposition are called factive verbs. Now, an interesting fact about factive verbs that for people working in formal semantics have known for 40 years is that the factivity presupposition is still triggered when the verb is embedded under negation. So what does that mean? Let's suppose that Peter says, John does not know that, P that Pittsburgh is nicer than Philadelphia. For Peter to say that, he must believe that Pittsburgh is nicer than Philadelphia, despite the fact that no is embedded under negation, right? I hope you, you all hear that uh, when, when you say it. Good. Right. However, in some contexts, this presupposition can be cancelled. So we know it's not cancelled when the, the, the factive verb is under a negation, but there's some syntactic concept, con context in English where the factivity presupposition can be cancelled. Under an equation as an epistemic model, but also perhaps might, that might cancel the factivity presupposition when knowing is embedded under a conditional that might also cancel the activity presupposition. So there's a lot of work in formal semantics on this question. Well, an interesting fact about formal semantics is that they do a lot of formal work without getting any, any data at all. Uh, so basically, there's a, a huge amount of theoretical work with a very thin empirical basis for the theorization. Now, our goals, in fact, there's actually a, only a handful of, of empirical papers on all these questions in, in the literature. So our goals was to examine across languages, and there's only like three or four papers that do that uh, before us, which verb types trigger factivity presupposition, and to examine the constellation of this presupposition across grammatical contexts. Uh, today, I'm not going to, for the sake of time, to tell you anything about the second part of the project. I just tell you about uh, which verb triggers factivity presupposition across, across contexts. The first way to study that was to contrast to know and to think. So to know is a factive verbs, right? When, when I said John knows that P, I must be believing that P is the case. Otherwise I would be saying John believes that P, right? In English. Uh, so we wanted to know whether this intuitive contrast that is very well known in English holds also in other languages. And we also look at the constellation in under epistemic models and the indicative conditional, but I won't be talking about that. So here's a way we, we did the study. We give participants the following short scenario. Imagine that there are two boxes, a red, block, a red box and a blue box. A coin has been hidden behind one of these two boxes. Your task is to identify the box under which a coin is hidden. To help you, because otherwise it would be 50-50, right? So to help you, we will tell you something about John. Yes, there's an empty job, right? And uh, you will be asked to choose one of the two boxes. And so here's a cue we give people. John knows that the coin is under the red box. Which box do you choose? Now, John knows, if, if we tell a participant, John knows that the coin is under the red box. So the participant is ex it triggers a factivity presupposition. So the participant is expecting me, who, who tells him or her that, <laughs> to believe that the coin is under the red box. Because I'm the person who did the experiment, I'm the one who knows which was the coin under the red box. So in that case, the participant should choose the red box. If I say, by contrast, John believes that the coin is under the red box, I'm not 
indicating anything about my own expectations about the location of, of the coin. And in that case, I'm not giving the same information to the participants. So the participant should be much, 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 much less likely to choose the red box when I say uh, John believes than or John thinks than when I say John knows. And the same should, be, should, should hold under negation. John doesn't know that the coin is under the red box. Ah, I'm telling the participant that the coin is under the red box because the fact, because the factivity presupposition is triggered even when no is under negation. All right, that's a concept, the basic idea. So we use the following pairs of, of, of verbs. John thinks that the coin is under the red box. John knows that the coin is under the red box. John doesn't think that the coin is under the red box. John knows that the coin is under the red box. John thinks that the coin isn't under the red box. John knows that the coin isn't under the red box. And then to, to look at uh, the constellation of the presupposition under epistemic models and under indicative condition. Our participants were drawn for the, from the usual, usual site. We're still waiting for the uh, uh, Indian data. And now I'm going to give you uh, the result. Uh, does to know trigger effectivity presupposition across languages? The way we're going to be answering the question is the following one. We're going to have an interaction between think and know, people are going to say, no is going to be very high. So if I, if I say it's under the red, uh, John knows under the red box, people should choose the red box. John thinks under the red box, people would probably choose the red box more often than not because it's still telling them something, just out of pragmatic principle. But there would be an interaction with John doesn't think, John doesn't know. John doesn't think it will drop down dramatically. John doesn't know it will remain very high if there's a factivity presupposition, right? That's what you find in English, of course. Formal semanticists work with English mostly, so that's exactly what you find in English. Think, so the, the blue bar is a think, the red bar is no, the yellow bar is doesn't think, the clear bar is doesn't know, all right? Uh, what you have here is a proportion of people who choose a red box when you tell them, John thinks it's uh, the coincidence of the red box, John knows the coincidence of the red box. In English, when you say John thinks, you give them some information, so they're more likely than not to choose a red box. But when you tell them John knows, it bumps up. It's a factivity presupposition, right? So you tell them that I, who designed the experiment, am committed to the truth that the coin does a red box because I'm the one who made the experiment, they should choose that. And you get the interaction I described when you say John doesn't think that the coin does a red box, it drops considerably. But John doesn't know that the coin does a red box it still triggers the assumption that the coin is under the red box. So you have this interaction. That's, what we, that's how we recognize effective verbs. This interaction is a mark of effective verb, right? Now, where do we find this, uh, where do we find this phenomenon? In most languages, but not in all. So in most languages, we're going to find a required triggering of effectivity presupposition. You look at Mandarin, you find the same phenomenon as in English. You look at Korean, you find the same phenomenon. You look at Japanese, uh, which is somewhere in Japanese here, you find the same phenomenon. At Spanish, both in Peru and Ecuador, the same interaction that I've just described. But we do not find it everywhere. There are uh, 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 some languages where the factivity presupposition is not required. It's optional. Which languages? Uh, we get focused on the case of Arabic in Morocco. As you can see in Arabic, you find the same pattern where you say things people more likely than not to say, okay, so does a red box, knows it bumps up a little bit. But for doesn't know, it's about nearly 50-50. So you hear 60-40, but in the other study, it's 50-50. What that means is that in, um, uh, in a language like Arabic, the factivity presupposition is not required. It's optional. You can actually notice that in English, you can actually hear also a non-factive reading of John doesn't know that the coin is under the red box. If you really try hard, you can see, yeah, it's not really, there's a reading on which actually it says nothing about the location of, of, of the coin. Um, in, um, uh, it's a reading that's not very available for most speakers of English. It's a reading that's actually totally available for people, uh, 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 for speakers of Africans, for speakers of Koreans, and for speakers of, of, of Arabic. Am I reading this incorrectly? You were talking about the relative ratio of the orange bar and the light blue bar. That's that that's that's right. So you still have that's why it's it's so not it looks kind of the same in Arabic. That's right. In English. That's uh, what well, it's not so much a ratio. It's, it's a two thing. It is a ratio. It's also whether the um, um, the 
uh, fertility presupposition is required. So what you see here in Arabic, and I'll show you some further data later, which is even clearer, is that in Arabic, you can have the two readings of John doesn't know what the crown is not a red box. You can have a reading where uh, uh, there's a factivity presupposition and a reading where there's no factivity presupposition. So how do you pick that up from the data? Because only six, because only fifty percent factor of people choose the red box, and while it's the other one, it's about eighty percent. So in the other one, it's required to assume that, oh, you tell me that John doesn't know that the culture of the red box, so the culture of the red box. Here it's not required, it's an optional reading of, of, of the sentence. Uh, um, and you have also a few languages where actually there's no real difference between the uh, doesn't think and doesn't know. In those languages, it's actually unclear whether there's actually any uh, triggering of effectivity presupposition. Uh, to be confirmed, there's a lot of things to be said about CPD and Isizulu, they are, um, are tonal languages. So using verbal material might actually be an issue there. If the tone is really what triggers effectivity presupposition, we don't know, we don't know about that. Um, uh, we're, working on, we're working on this, uh, understanding this uh, data. Okay, so to know, to know triggers effectivity presupposition in many languages as a modal type of, of, of answer. But the patterns vary across languages. For most languages, they required presupposition. In some languages, an optional presupposition. In a few languages, there might not be any presupposition at all, but I, I want to be careful about, about that claim there. The second study we did was extending the same design for other types of, of verbs. Why? Because it's done for a very long time since the beginning of work in formal semantics and factivity that other verbs beyond, beyond to know I, I also have a factive profile. Things like to be angry is that. So if I tell you John is angry, the John is angry that the coin does a red box and communicating to you that the coin does a red box. John is not angry that the coin does a red box. I'm also communicating to you that the coin is under the red box. But in linguistics, these other verbs are called semi-factive, meaning they're not fully factive. They're, they're, uh, factivity is optional or uh, soft-factivity needs something else for the factivity to be triggered. So what we did that, we, we use various cognitive verbs, remembering, uh, understanding. We use perceptual verb, hearing, seeing, smelling. So smelling was not for a coin, it was for a piece of chocolate, uh, something like that. Uh, declarative verbs, I won't be talking about declarative verbs, largely because in linguistics there's this claim that no declarative verb is factive, which is obviously false. <laughs> I mean, uh, I confess, uh, John doesn't confess that P, just factivity presupposition that P is the case, but we have, I think that we have data about that, and emotive verbs. Today I'll be presenting the cognitive verbs, the perceptual verbs, and the emotive verbs. Think no is going to be our benchmark. Then we have uh, remember, understand, and learn. As, as a professor, I wanted to know whether learning is factive. I know I was very keen on <laughs> seeing whether my students take that. I, yeah, that's what I saw too at the beginning. Then perceptual verbs, we're interested in possible contrast within the class of perceptual verbs. Uh, uh, are some perceptual verbs factive, but others are not seeing, hearing, and smelling. Uh, I won't be talking about the declarative verbs, except if you're interested. And the emotive verb, we had positive and negative emotive verbs, uh, guilt, uh, resentment, anger, and happiness. All right. And that's the same design, except instead of having two contexts in which the factivity presupposition can be considered, we only had one to an epistemic model. Our participants, we don't have yet the full data because that's part of the second wave of data collection. So we're still waiting for a few more data sets for that study um, um, in Japan, Korea, and, and India. So do cognitive verbs trigger effectivity presupposition? That's the same type of, of data I've shown you uh, earlier on the x-axis, the country, on the y-axis, people who choose a red box when you have a proposition about the red box. That's the verbs without the negation, that's a verb without with the negation. Right. Uh, so the first one is going to be, for example, knows versus, versus so thinks versus doesn't think. The same pattern I showed you earlier. The second one is going to be knows versus doesn't know. The same pattern I showed you earlier. Right. And then what you have for the three other bars are the three other cognitive verbs: remembering, understanding, learning. So remembering versus doesn't remember. Understanding versus doesn't understand. Learn versus doesn't learn. You have a factivity presupposition if you have the same pattern for the three other cognitive verbs as you have for knowledge, in contrast for thinking. Right? That's, that's the way we rationalize factivity presupposition. 
In English, you find this very neat pattern that basically the three other cognitive verbs really function like no. Uh, anyway, in many ways, um, they're all connected. There's a way to gloss remembering and a way to gloss understanding. Uh, understanding maybe come to know, maybe under some, some, some reading and learning, maybe getting to know something. So um, uh, unsurprisingly, we get the same uh, type of behavior for the three verbs. In other contexts, we get variation across cognitive verbs. Uh, so for example, in, in, in Spain, uh, both uh, in uh, Peru and in Ecuador, um, uh, while the three verbs will trigger some kind of activity presupposition, understanding will be, will be different from the other. So it will be variation within the type of cognitive verbs. And again, in Arabic, as I've told you earlier, you find the same phenomenon that, that we observed in the previous data set. Uh, there is a triggering of activity presupposition for, this, for all the cognitive verbs, but it's optional. It's not, just not required. Listener can hear both a factive and a non-factive reading of knowing, understanding, remembering, and learning. And again, the CPD says there's no evidence of any factivity presupposition in CPD. Replicating the results we had actually earlier uh, that are presented to you. Do perceptual verbs trigger effectivity presupposition, seeing, hearing, and smelling? Again, there's a sense way of presenting the data. Here, that's in the affirmative context. Yeah, uh, seeing, seeing, so thinking, knowing, seeing, uh, hearing, and smelling. And here, that's a negation, right? And um, 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 so a bunch of things are, are interesting. The first one is that in some countries, Seeing and the other verbs are extremely different from one another. So seeing is factive. When you say John sees or John saw that the coin under the red box, people assume that the coin under the red box. Not so when you say John heard that the coin was under the red box when you shoot the box. Then there's no presupposition of factivity in that case. Same is true for smelling. And as you can see, it's a fairly robust pattern in many languages. Seeing also is different from knowing. While knowing is this language that requires effectivity presupposition, seeing has a much more optional feature, optional nature, right? Um, so that's uh, one thing. Again, in other countries, like in Arabic, none of the three verbs trigger effectivity presupposition. Seeing does not trigger an effectivity presupposition in, in, in Arabic. Last type of verbs I want to be presenting today is emotive verbs. And the reason we looked at emotive verbs is because they're called semi-factive, as I mentioned earlier. They're viewed to be not clear example of factive verbs in linguistics. In fact, the exact opposite is true. Uh, uh, emotive verbs are factive in all the languages we've looked at. Whether they're positive or negative verbs, they always trigger effectivity presuppositions across, across all the languages. So in fact, if, there's, if there are factive verbs in addition to knowing, it is actually the, the emotive verb. These are the typical, the typical example of verbs that communicate some information about what you know and what you don't know, which I think is totally understandable if you think about the moral context. Uh, I think that makes exactly total sense. Um, and you can see it's a very, even in the Arabic, remember the Arabic data set, for many verbs uh, in Arabic, knowing did not require a, 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 factivity, a factivity presupposition, just an optional factivity presupposition. In the case of the emotive verb, it, is, it works exactly as it works in English for knowing. Uh, so that's actually totally, uh, totally unexpected in the uh, formal semantics uh, literature. So I'm actually uh, looking forward to uh, publishing this data uh, and see what English have to say. All right, to, uh, to summarize, languages vary in how cognitive and perceptual verbs trigger factivity presupposition in a way that's very similar to the variation we observe for to know. You know, in Arabic, we didn't find a required factivity presupposition. We don't find it uh, for, for perceptual verbs either. Um, 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 uh, to see differ from other perceptual verbs, except in Arabic and Mandarin, where they don't trigger any factivity presupposition at all. At least in the study we have. And emotive verbs appear, appear to be the best trigger for factivity presupposition, which is surprising and unexpected based on the existing literature. Seem to be the best example of a factive verb and not at all semi factive verbs as they've been described uh, until now. Our conclusions as linguistic variations, a compl complicated pattern where things seem to be universal, a few things, seems to be rob like a modal answer across languages and, and a, a, an interesting pattern of, 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 of variation. Uh, you've got required a optional factivity presupposition for to know versus other cognitive verbs. 
Perceptual verbs in Arabic and Mandarin are very different. Uh, emotive verbs appear to, to work roughly the same way in all the languages we've been uh, looking at. And we have a ton of unexpected results. The fact that emotive verbs trigger factivity presupposition, the fact that to see in when it triggers factivity presupposition, not everywhere, but do that in, a, in an optional manner. I would have, you know, if you had asked me for the study, I would have expected to see to work exactly like to know, because I would have said there's a deep connection between the two. It's just does not appear to be to be the case. And there are differences between seeing and other perceptual modalities, which again I would not have uh, expected um, uh, before beforehand. This is to be a fairly robust pattern, except in Mandarin and Arabic, where the three attitude in a non-factive manner. Again, I'd like to thank the member. I'd like to thank Patrick Kelly, who is here, who's been uh, uh, instrumental in developing these studies. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for the finishing again, and thank you for your attention.